this is Matt Rourke. He is the lead of the Dairy Cat Project, and in his minimal amount of time not managing that, he's also a soil scientist. Uh, he's an associate professor at uh, UW-Madison, and he's going to talk to us about integrating cover crops into dairy systems. Thanks, Becky. So, yeah, so every once in a while I get to do actual science. I'm still a scientist. Um, and so one of the big areas, so I work in the area of nutrient management and soil fertility, and very interested in the use of cover crops as it's connected with manure use. Um, and what happens in the landscape or what happens in our production system when we do it. So I've got, I've got uh, two different trials that I'm going to talk a little bit about today. But just to give you a sense of, um, in the 2012 Ag Census was the last time they surveyed farmers on cover crop use. And so the darker green uh, indicates more cover crop use. So in Wisconsin, we have this area where we have over 20% of the land with uh, cover crops. But this is mostly, this is our central sand plain, which is a lot of vegetables, sandy soils, a lot of wind erosion. So that's what's used here. But, you know, in the areas, we have a little bit more uh, cover crop use compared to, to other states, at least uh, in this direction. Uh, we have more cropping systems, I think, that where it's a little bit easier to get the cover crops planted. In terms of a little more winter wheat, and we have corn silage. So that's going to be the big, the big reason. And so what we want to do is look at the, what's the long-term effect of using cover crops in a corn silage system. Um, so I want to evaluate the growth in nit uh, and nitrogen uptake of winter rye as a cover crop. It's by far the most popular one used. And it survives the winter, so you have that extra uh, soil protection. We want, but we also want to evaluate it as a dual use crop, as a, either as a cover crop or it's used as a forage crop. Uh, and then we want to evaluate how the rye affects soil nitrate and corn silage yields and then quantify the total silage production uh, of the system. So uh, we're going to work in a system that is continuous corn silage with a fall application of liquid dairy manure, and then we're going to plant the cover crop. So um, it, and we always we calculate it per year. It tend, it, we're trying to get around 10,000 gallons per acre. It's varied a little bit. And then we always had the nutrient content of the, the nitrogen, which also varied a little bit as well. But what we can see is when we have a situation, this is what it would look like in the spring. We have these strips uh, without a cover crop. We have the strips where we have chemically terminated the rye cover crop, or we're going to let it grow and we're going to harvest it. Um, we have uh, the we have uh, this is we have five we have five years now of of, con of continual work on this. It's all on the same plots of land. So by the end, we're looking at this cumulative this cumulative effect. And so across our five years, you can see it's the, the amount of biomass just in the right cover is obviously going to be hugely dependent on, uh, on the amount of, you know, on the amount of uh, the heat and the growing conditions. Where our first year and the last year were years where there was just incredible conditions. A lot of growth in the fall, a lot of growth in the spring. And you can see we had almost, you know, a ton and a half of dry matter uh, with 115 or 74 pounds of nitrogen uh, in, in that above ground biomass. But in, in other years, I mean, we're not, we're not even getting to, you know, a half ton, maybe we're close to a quarter ton of biomass with about 10 pounds. I left everything in English units, sorry about that. Uh, we left, but, but not that much. So it seems to be we either get a little bit of growth or a lot of growth. Um, so just that little bit extra growth that happens really takes off. So the, the trick is, well, what's the, you know, is anything bad happening when we have the, a lot of nitrogen uptake this is nitrogen that's tied up in biomass, but returned to the system. So you compare that to a rye as a forage crop where that's all harvested and physically removed from the system. Um, but in most cases, again, that, that mimicked a little bit where we had our biggest yields in the, in the first year and last year, um, and you know, uh, around the same in those middle three years. But this is you know, anywhere between 65 and 125 pounds of nitrogen physically removed from the system. In most years, uh, in two of the five years, the timing worked out where we planted that next corn silage crop at the same time, regardless of what the cover treatments were. But in the other three years, the, we planted corn uh, maybe two to three weeks later in that rye forage crop because it would need to grow a little bit longer. All right, so rye always reduced nitrate in the upper foot of soil, the ryelage. Uh, so the rise, uh, rise of forage crop always reduced it in the second foot. So regardless of year, in the, so no cover crop, rye cover crop, or rye lich. In the blue, that's the first foot. The gray is the second foot. So we always see uh, 
If we're here to here, we always saw a reduction in soil nitrate in that first foot. Sometimes we saw it in the second foot as well, but the rylage always seemed to reduce, looking at these gray bars, uh, reduce that nitrate in that second foot as well. So um, in terms of benefits to water quality, it's, it's having obviously a bigger impact. You let it grow a little bit longer, the roots go down an extra, you know, an extra foot. Well, what about the, what about yields? So again, this is, it's a, it's not <coughs> common to go five straight years of continuous corn silage, but as we've moved in Wisconsin away from alfalfa based production to corn silage as a, as a big uh, feed source, uh, it, it could be more common. You know, sometimes we see two, three, uh, and occasion we'll see four, uh, consecutive years. But, uh, so what happens to yield? So what we're looking at here, and I have all these graphs the same way. So this is yield uh, at 65% moisture in tons per acre. And we also had three different nitrogen rates that we uh, were evaluating. It ended up not being a big part of the study, but we wanted to see if it also affected the nutrient availability of the manure. So in the squares, that this is uh, corn silage yield following no cover crop, in the circles, that's following the rye cover crop, and the triangles are following the rylage crop. So you can see in this first year, we really didn't see much of a difference uh, that rye, even though there's quite a bit of biomass uh, that, that spring, it wasn't having an effect on that, um, on that corn uh, silage yield. But with the rylage always, and this was all planted at the same, the corn silage was planted on the same date in this year, that rylage reduced, uh, reduced yields. But when we added in, we added back in that rylage on a 65% moisture basis, we broke even. We, we had about the same amount of total biomass produced that year. So that's the other way we're looking at. What's the effect on the corn silage, but what's the effect on the total amount of, of, of uh, feed produced? In, uh, but in 2012, you see, I mean, it's messy, but what we can look at is there's, again, no, no real effect of that rye cover crop uh, reducing yield, but once the, the rye forage crop didn't decrease that corn silage yield that much, and we were up quite a bit of biomass. So in this year, we were up biomass produced in 2016, another year with we had that bumper, bumper crop. So when we looked at over all the, all the years, not to bore you with all the data, but uh, the rylage, yet the <coughs> yield decreases uh, in the subsequent yield, uh, corn silage yield, and that was pretty consistent, but we were up total biomass in three or five years and we broke even in two or five years, so we never were down production. We never were down production. We always at least maintain or increase production by having this double, double cropping system. Um, for the most part, so the, the values between 2012 and 2015 were very similar in terms of the, the crude protein content of the rylage, uh, but in 2016, we actually had a, a decrease. <coughs> um, where the, the quality was a little bit different in 2016 compared to the previous years. But overall, when you, when you take this all the way out to a pound of milk produced per ton of forage, that rylage was a very high quality. Um, and so we're really happy to see that. And you know, it's something that could be, could be useful. Now, the other aspect of this is that we've taken this five years consecutively. So what's the, what is that rye or the rylage done to the soil? And I'm particularly interested in the ability of uh, what's it done to the nitrogen supply. So if we think about uh, the nitrogen pools of potentially mineralizable <coughs> nitrogen. Uh, so this is a measure, uh, it's a relatively simple measure. It's an anaerobically, uh, it's an incubation, an anaerobic incubation, and we just simply look at the increase in ammonium over those seven days. So it's used in soil health assessments. But it's a nice, it's a nice assessment. And so what we did in the last year, in 2016, we went out and we sampled every month during the growing season in this trial. And what we're looking at here is the first bar is the cover crop, uh, the cover crop plots. The second bar is the, uh, the rylage plots. And the last bar is the no cover crop. And these are always in the upper, uh, so zero to 15 centimeters. And these, uh, these smaller bars are in the 15 to 30 centimeters. So first off, all the action in nitrogen mineralization is happening in that upper uh, six inches, 15 centimeters of soil. But what we did over, uh, for the first four months of the growing season, it was clear that, that the plots that historically had those, that rye planted on them had an increased uh, nitrogen supply in that soil in, in, in the context of this measure. 
And for the most part, uh, in, in several of those months, having that rileage there as well also increased it. So it goes into the fact that if we're going to have corn silage, uh, having uh, that cover crop there is not only, uh, not, in this case, was not detrimental to yield, but also was improving uh, the soil in, specifically in this way. So at least maintaining or potentially increasing that mineralizable nitrogen pool. So that was very exciting to see. All right, but not to throw, now, now we have more data that conflicts with, uh, conflicts with that data a little bit. But so in that previous stuff, that was continuous corn silage. So we're looking at the effect of a cover crop on corn silage. We have, we have a bunch of work where we're looking at the effect of these cover crops on corn grain. And we're seeing slightly different results. We had, um, we have uh, look, experiment stations throughout the state. Um, but what we did is we grew, a, we grew corn silage we put out fall manure and then we planted different, we had an extra cover crop. We had no cover crop, we had winter rye that survives the winter, or spring barley, which grows a little bit faster than the winter rye in the fall, but will winter kill. So then we don't have to manage that in the spring. So that's a, a potential benefit. But what we do then, so we have corn yield and nitrogen rate, and then we have a, quite a few more nitrogen rates here. And what we're looking at is this response curve. So the first thing is in the blue, this is the response curve for, uh, for corn grain following no cover crop. In the green is following spring barley. And the winter rye, which was the plateau curve, uh, is in red. So the first thing we see here is that there's a 10 bushel yield reduction following that spring barley uh, in, at, at, in these rates, and a 17 bushel yield reduction in winter rye. Now, this was a, this past year was a bumper year for, for total, you know, we had a lot of biomass grown. Uh, so this was 2016 yield, so this would have been covers planted in 2015. But we had quite a bit of dry matter biomass produced. Um, that's probably what's, what's driving this. But interestingly, we're not seeing that effect, you know, and this is, these are all in plots that are, you know, quarter of a mile, not even that, from those other plots that I was talking about. It's the same soil, same growing conditions, where we're seeing that negative effect uh, when you take it to corn grain, but when it's corn silage, we're not seeing that negative effect. Um, and sometimes we don't always see that negative effect. We've typically, so in previous years, in 2015, we saw a negative effect with the winter rye, also reducing corn grain yield, but not spring barley. You know, these response curves are right on top of each other, so no real effect. So, um, how consistent is this effect of spring barley and how, you know, what's that, uh, what's the driver of it? Is there a biomass, you know, total dry matter biomass production where once you've exceeded, that's going to uh, cause some yield reductions. But even at other locations, so this is in Lancaster, this is in southwest Wisconsin. In the blue, that's following no cover crop and the green is following spring barley. And what's interesting is that we have pretty flat response curves, meaning that the manure that was applied that previous fall was basically supplying all the nitrogen that was needed at this site. But we have this nine bushel yield decrease and we couldn't make up, we couldn't, in, we couldn't make up that yield gap with adding more nitrogen. So it's, it's something that's happening that's not nitrogen related. All right, um, but you see with winter rye, we're seeing both effects. Well, one is it's clearly taken up more nitrogen because now we need a lot more nitrogen to maximize yield, but also we couldn't make up for it with more nitrogen. And there we had a 35 bushel uh, yield decrease. So we've got some issues to work on with cover crop use uh, and this potential effect. Um, the other issue is that, well, if we go to spring barley, you know, here's a picture of what the fields look like. Uh, we had annual ryegrass in there too, but even with a fair amount of biomass with spring barley, it's, it doesn't leave a lot of dead residue biomass, you know, as coverage. Now this was a year without the bumper, the bumper yield. You know this is probably close to a quarter ton, maybe half ton. Uh, there's just not a lot left. Well, the winter rye is still providing that soil coverage in the spring. So then when I when I talk about this, I talk about who wins or who loses right now with with cover crop use uh, with manure. Well, the soil wins. So there's a clear reduction in yield. You have soil coverage. Uh, we have quite a bit of biomass. That's definitely happening. Groundwater quality, we clearly are going to have a reduction in nitrogen leaching uh, in the fall and maybe a little bit in the spring, just if you look at what the residual nitrate concentrations are in the soil. But the losers are manure. So it, we are, you know, when we talk about 
nitrogen credits from manure, having a cover crop there changes them in some way. I don't have enough data yet to quantify exactly how, how much, but if you're using book values for your nitrogen credits for manure and you, but you're using a cover crop, I don't, I just, that's, I think that's going to be a, uh, it's going to be way overestimated. And yield. So consistent yield reductions have, are, have been noted. I don't know what the magic bullet is or what the other mechanisms or other management practices we can do to help alleviate that. Basically just identified it at many sites. Um, is it, we've typically, we have that fall manure, we've put out our nitrogen as a side dress application. Should I move that up and put it out at planting to try to help stimulate some decomposition? How much can that help? But if it doesn't seem to be a nitrogen driven process, uh, how much how much would we expect that to help so uh, how am i on time You're good perfect all right so that's what i have uh, i think we have a lot more work to do on cover crop use um, but i think it's going to be an incredibly important component especially in adaptation practices so with that i'd be happy to answer any questions or comments concerns questions um, i know it's not in this presentation but are you tracking this phosphorus phase Yes, when we have, uh, we've been, we've basically been tracking phosphorus through soil test phosphorus levels throughout the growing season. We haven't, that's a, yeah. Uh, we haven't seen any terribly interesting trends yet um, with it. So the other thing is we have the long, that long-term study where it's continuous. Everything else I've done is just single year effects, right? So it's the first time that field has had a cover crop and it's that corn grain yield. So there we're looking at how much can we be reducing a soil test phosphorus level just in that one year. Um, and we haven't been able to pick up anything terribly interesting yet. Question? Al. The, uh, I don't know. Yeah, so we haven't measured, we haven't measured soil moisture um, in that, and that it could be it could be one limiting thing. We we do see um, we do see uh, you know it was interesting in the in that first year in 2012 in the that was when that year started. We had a very dry summer in 2012, and we saw the corn. You could you could tell which plots were which, where the cover crop, the corn without a cover crop was 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 much taller than the ones following it but yet the yields at the end of the year were about the same for silage. So it still grew out of it, at least in a biomass content. So there's something that's happening between just the biomass issue versus a grain formation issue that's driving it. So, um, uh, in, so I guess my comment is that it, it appears if that effect is gonna be really strong on the, on the grain, but not, the, not necessarily the biomass. Okay, uh, to keep on time, we're gonna keep moving. Thank you, Matt, appreciate it.